and you are now free to think. As we uh, continue in our study in Romans, we will pick up in verse 14 tonight. And if you remember uh, last week, we uh, kind of stayed on verse 13 quite a bit, and we were talking about the largest denomination in the world. Do you remember what denomination that was? The congregation of the Ignorant Brethren. We want to make sure we're not members of that congregation. <laughs> hey, I've been a member of that congregation, so you know I can talk about it. I won't ask if any of you have been members of that congregation, ignorant brethren. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. It's not related to this. What's? I know this is considered Holy Week. So what are we so? What are they or whoever celebrating today? Or what are they doing today? Well, so like, meant, like the Methodists, I know they were they were both. Oh, I don't know because I don't keep up with that with that calendar that is off and inaccurate. I mean, it, even Palm Sunday, if you take the biblical chronology, I should have brought some of those. Um, charts that I've got that gives the chronology of the the biblical chronology of the Passion Week we call it. Palm Sunday wasn't Palm Sunday; it was more like Palm Friday. <laughs> and so, anyway, I'm not sure. I I don't know what uh, day this would be as far as like in the what they call the the Holy Week calendar. Uh, Sunday was Palm Sunday. Uh, I don't know, to tell you the truth. Didn't hear the question. Okay. What in the like in the say the, the Catholic calendar or the the kind of institutional Easter Passion Week calendar? What what day would this be? I know yesterday was. I know there's, a lot, there's been a lot of debate on that because, you know, the Nicene Creed or whatever it is, that was a big issue. Mm -hmm. They decided on the Julian calendar or, yeah. you know, two different calendars. There's a lot of debate on mm -hmm. which calendar they follow during the holidays. Yeah. Holiday. So, I don't really know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the thing is that, that it's just really... Glaring. <laughs> okay, yeah, there you go. Look at Google. There we go. But you know, it's glaring error and in inaccuracy to follow the whole Good Friday, you know, stuff like that. I mean, just a, a, a fundamental understanding of the Feast of Israel will show anyone if they'll take the time to look at it. And I don't know why these, you know. University eggheads don't take the time to read the Bible if they're, you know, or when they established all these things, unless they had some ulterior motive to corrupt the truth of God's Word, did they uh, establish, you know, the, the Good Friday unless they were just, you know, leaders of the congregation of ignorant brethren. So, anyway, you can look in Leviticus chapter 23 and it gives the rundown of the seven feasts and it states clearly that, um, you know, the week of Passover starts with Passover, then you have the seven days of unleavened bread, the first day is a Sabbath, and the last day is a Sabbath. And somewhere in that seven day period, your normal Saturday Sabbath will fall in there somewhere. So uh, that's what we find there in Christ's Passion Week. You find that, uh, and there's debate on this, he's crucified, it could have been like Wednesday evening or Thursday evening. My figuring, I figure Wednesday evening is when that was the day of Passover. Thursday was the first day of unleavened bread, which was a Sabbath day. That's why you had to be buried before that Sabbath began. If you notice in the Gospel of John, it says for that Sabbath was a high day. You know, it was a special Sabbath. Anyway, when you put all those things together, it's easy to see and easy to understand that uh, the whole Good Friday thing is, is just error. It's wrong. And, uh, well, it's kind of like the sunrise service. Sunrise service. That's another... You know, the, the Bible states that when the women got there to the tomb that morning, before the sun rose, 
And he was already gone. The tomb was open and he was already gone. So the whole thing of Jesus being resurrected at sunrise, it's a fallacy. It is not biblical. So, you know. While we're on that subject, you know, I was reading in Ezekiel chapter 8, and I think it's verse 11 through 16, it's talking about, I think 14 is talking about uh, they were in the temple facing east, worshiping, worshiping the sun. Yeah. Which would be, the, it, would, it said the east sun, which would be the morning sun. Yeah. But the verse before that is talking about the women were on the steps. And weeping for weeping Tammuz. For Tammuz. Well, yeah. Look up Tammuz. Tammuz was the husband of Ishtar. Yeah. And if you <laughs> translate Ishtar into English, it's Easter. It's Easter. Yeah. So I, it could, somebody read that and explain to me if that has a bearing on yeah. what we're doing today. Well, that's the thing. See, they incorporated that pagan Roman festival exactly. just when Constantine incorporated the church into the Roman government and, and uh, legitimized it and all that. Well, they just incorporated all those pagan festivals right in there. And the mother goddess worship and all that. Just Remember when we looked at the stuff with Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz and all that? It's all one and the same. And you can trace that same... Mother goddess, sun worship, child worship, cult, all the way back, <clears throat> excuse me, all the way back to ancient Babylon. And it has it the same thing, even the same <clears throat> symbolism. You know, there's the, uh, what they call the Orphic egg, you know, the egg symbol. That goes all the way back to ancient Babylon, to the, to the mystery religions and all those kind of things. So, so yeah, the, the whole Easter and, you know, and don't be thrown off by the fact that the, the Bible uses the word Easter over there in Acts chapter, I think it's 14, 12, 4, Acts 12, 4, where Herod makes reference to Easter. He, you know, he's got Peter in prison and he's going to execute him. And he says, after Easter. Well, Herod is not talking about the resurrection of Christ that the, the, the Christians observe. And he's not making reference to Passover. He's making reference to the pagan Roman festival of Easter. That's why he calls it Easter. So, you know, those are the kind of things we need to understand. And I know a lot of people say, oh, well, what difference does all that make? Well, it does make a difference because that's how Satan works to pull the wool over our eyes and hoodwink us and take us right into paganism. We, you know, we're worshiping pagan things. We've got pagan symbols and taking part in pagan activities and festivals, you know? So I deliver that crack and you crack it. And we look for little cracks to get into. Yeah, yeah. I this week and you crack it. Oh, yeah? <laughs> the man's made of the cursing of the fig tree. I don't know if oh. you have a name for it, but that's what he did today. Oh, okay. Mm hmm. You know, and there again, about like the, the cursing of the fig tree, we try to take that and we try to make all kind of modern day applications to that, to apply it to today or something, and it doesn't. You know, that's a, a specific sign to Israel. And there's a, it, even that is a prophetic fulfillment. There's a verse somewhere in Isaiah. I can't remember where. I'll have to look it up. Maybe we'll uh, uh, talk about it next week if I remember. It's not a Catholic or a Protestant thing or anything. It's it's why, I mean... Oh, um, yeah. All religions, it's not any particular religion. No, it's no. The fact that all religions basically practice. Yeah, all religions uh, have some elements of paganism that have been incorporated in there. And it all, and I may sound like a broken record uh, uh, sometimes, and I don't mean to, but that is why it is so important that we learn the Bible in the proper framework. That Number one, we learn how to rightly divide the word so that we understand what, you know, Paul wrote as the Lord gave him instructions to us today. And we're not trying to take stuff out of Israel's program and the instruction to them and apply it to us or our stuff and apply it to them and wind up in all this confused stuff. You know, a lot of that stuff that happened during Passover week doesn't have that much bearing on anything to do with us. Jesus, His death and resurrection has direct bearing to us because Jesus 
even though he came as God's apostle directly to Israel to do the covenant stuff with them, bring the message to them as their prophesied redeemer and so forth. In spite of that, still, his death incorporated all of humanity because Jesus, as the sinless Son of God, you know, uh, paid the penalty, as we understand, for all people, to provide forgiveness for all people. And his resurrection applies to us too. But other than that, those other things were uh, for and about Israel. So, but, that, you know, this is what we've ended up with now. And now, because... All right, the question that has come to my mind for, for a long time is this. Okay, like figuring out that the whole Good Friday scenario didn't make sense and it didn't work. I mean, I can remember from when I was a little kid, you know, reading that and hearing about it and thinking, that just doesn't make sense. How do you get three days and three nights out of Friday and Saturday? You can't get... What, and it, that confused me for years. So finally, you know, I read over there in Leviticus 23 and began to learn about the Feast of Israel. And it's like, that's what... And then I went back over in the Gospels and started looking through there. Said, that's what that means. No wonder. And I thought, why didn't somebody see this before? Surely, surely, I'm not the first one to turn back over here and read this and see how simple that is. And I found out that I wasn't the first one. And I wasn't the only one. That through history, there had been people that noticed that. And they stood up and talked about it. And they said, hey, wait a minute. We've got the wrong viewpoint on this. And guess what happened to them? Out. You know, out the door. A lot of them were killed for it. A lot of them were killed for it, you know. For pointing out, you know, we hear about like John Knox and Tyndall and a lot of those guys that were martyrs and so forth. And now the story we get, and, and I'm sure it's true, I'm not saying it's not true, but I don't think we're getting the whole story. We had like Tyndall and Knox and those guys, they printed Bibles and wanted to get the Bible into the hands of the common man. So they were burned at the stake for it. Well, there was probably more than that to it. They were probably pointing out that, hey, wait a minute, the church is filled with paganism, you know, everything from the whole mother-child symbol to all of the sun worship symbols and Venus, you know, symbols and all those kind of things, and the Babylonian uh, figures and, and all that ancient Babylonian paganism. I, I bet those guys started to point that out. And so, ooh, man. You know, they brought the wrath of the devil down on them and the wrath of the establishment. So, you know, you, know, you, don't, hear much about, stake. you don't hear much about paganism, pagan stuff in the churches these days. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think because it's not talked about and it's not taught that Christians, you know, yeah. they, don't, they don't hear it in church, the ones that go on a regular basis. So they're, yeah. they're not going to know. I mean, no. it just needs to be, it needs to be well, talked about. You know, you well, got to talk about hardly anything in church is there things you don't scare somebody off or anything. Most churches. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a lot of it. all, you know, come in here and fill a place up and mm -hmm. put a quarter in a box. And, yeah. You know, it's sad to say, I mean, not all churches are that way. And not, not all the whole church is that way. Even, mm -hmm. even a sermon, you know, may not be totally about that, but... Mm -hmm. Everything comes back to that. Right, that's the because general focus. Yeah, yeah, so it's like Christmas with Walmart and all that stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, church, more or less, the same thing nowadays. Well, yeah. if a pastor stood up and said, you know, that the, the Easter eggs and all this kind of stuff is, is you know, pagan stuff, mm -hmm. but the people would think he's crazy. Yeah. And, and, and it does not sound because that's what they've mm -hmm. always done is Easter egg hunts. Yeah. And, you know, and see, I think that's one of the biggest problems right there is the fact that. It comes in when they're little children. Yeah. And you get yeah. the whole Easter, Christmas, and all that stuff. So by the time, you know, back then they're all, oh, everything's great. Jesus is great. You mm -hmm. know, the Easter bunny and mm -hmm. all this stuff here. Then when they get up old enough to actually start getting into it and start mm -hmm. kind of understanding the whole deal and the whole sin thing yeah. and start really committing sins, and they're like, oh, that's all malarkey because yeah. it's all fairy tale. It's all fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah. So Satan's getting them from little children. And we're helping. Yeah, exactly. you know, yeah, the church is helping. Yeah, 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 and that's 
That's how Satan that's works. Satan that's works. the that's counterfeit it. in the deception. He, you know, he he didn't he didn't come in and try to just wipe out the Bible, wipe out Christianity. No, 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 no. Don't wipe it out because you can't wipe it out. You can't get rid of it. So just corrupt it. You know, it's corrupt it enough from like just corrupt it enough and blend, you know, blend in uh, stuff I mean, and put that's a tool that he yeah, uses. paint it with Christianity. Take the, the you know these pagan gods and give them saints' names and take you know the Marian baby Jesus and you know or take the take the old pagan mother child cult symbol and turn that into Marian Jesus right. and you know and all that's those kind of things and. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's, there's never, there's no hint anywhere, anywhere in any of the scripture, even in the gospels that gives, you know, what details it does about Mary. Nowhere do you get any indication that Mary was ever held up. Right. As, you know, none of the disciples, disciples ever said anything about you know her, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being held up in some high esteem or or anything like that. I'm sure she was. I'm sure Jesus she's received love. Like, Jesus never even spoke about himself. Or it was always yeah. the Father. Yeah. I mean, you know, him himself. Yeah. He never said, "Well, you know, hold me up, you know, and right. worship me or anything." Everything was yeah. the Father. Yeah. And I just heard a sermon today this morning. I got to hear part of it anyway about the same thing. What you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Mary never was nowhere mm -hmm. in the Bible. Held up like that. Right? No. So that's all, you know, that's all mankind's stuff, man made stuff, uh, religious elements that came in. And uh, they were talking about this kind of a little different, but they were talking about also, he was talking a sermon about how Mary, and I never thought about this, said Mary could have stopped the whole thing. Oh, yeah. All she had to do was go up there and say, He's my son, He's yeah. crazy. You know, yeah, he yeah. keeps coming up with all these ideas. I don't know. We took him to doctors, man. Mm -hmm. Something wrong with him. Yeah, you know, yeah. And stopped the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But she did because yeah. she knew. Yeah. And yeah. so therefore, she did. You know, she didn't do it. Yeah. I, I've yeah. never heard that. Never thought of it. And I'm like, well, yeah. that's that's probably that's yeah. saying something. Yeah. A lot of people do that. A lot, a lot of integrity she showed exactly. in that, and not trying to do something to save Jesus' life. You know, mm -hmm. because she knew. Uh, from the beginning, you can read there in, I think it's Luke chapter, no, maybe it's Matthew, I think it's Matthew where it gives the Mary's statement there. And uh, when you read that, what she said, you know, when she, I think she was talking to Elizabeth about, when you know, uh, that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. And those things that she said, Mary had a very profound understanding of the scriptures. She understood all about the covenants. She understood the prophecy, and she understood about the Messiah and all those things. So yeah, she 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 knew she understood those things. And so yeah, when uh, Jesus was crucified, she she understood yeah. what was going on. You know, she knew to love God enough to, yeah. to stick yep. with it instead of yep. saving her son. Right, trying to save. Yep, that's right. And that's pretty fascinating. You think? Yeah. About that. yeah. But most mothers, you know, I mean, the yeah. first thing a mother's going to do is yeah. whatever they can to save the baby. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just yeah. that's a mother's instinct. Yeah. She didn't, so yeah, it shows a lot of integrity on her part. But what do you do? Sound like the church is doing everything stuff now. I mean, it's kind of a hard thing to fight against towards all the pagan stuff that was busy in the churches and everything, you know, because it's kind of like, how do you get it out? It's not going to. Most people say, well, if we're not celebrating things like that and we're making a difference, but what does God say about it? Like in Ezekiel, it says, I, I turn away from my temple because of that. Yeah. Same thing, you'll turn away from the church because of that. Well, right. you know, and it's, it's like this. You know, what if, <laughs> what, what if one of us men was sitting in a, in a strip club somewhere? You know, hey, I'm not taking part in it. I'm not drinking or, yeah. you know, looking at the window or anything like that. I'm just in here. <laughs> Yeah, not fine. you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you you know if you're there you're con you're you condone. Here's the thing that is the biggest problem with that, and that is that if the environment exists in that church organization whatever, where you don't have the Avenue, opportunity, freedom 
to say, hey, wait just a minute. There's some stuff wrong with this picture. Just give it a consideration. Yeah. Look, look here and here. Let me show you know. So let me show the evidence. If you don't have that opportunity, uh, then there's a problem. You know. I mean, I think that when we see stuff that's not right in in the church the body of Christ, we first of all, you know, do some investigation. Make sure we're right. But when we see something that's just glaringly non-biblical, we should say something. Uh, we should we should have the liberty and we should have the right to be able to say something and our voice be heard. Mm -hmm. Because listen, the, the body of Christ is supposed to be like a family. Right. It's not supposed to be like a corporate boardroom. Right. You know, where the CEO is the man and everybody else is stupid peons that need to keep their mouth shut. Mm -hmm. So we you know we need to be able to say something and uh, you know make our case. Uh, if not and you know you just shut down or dismissed then maybe we should follow Paul's advice where he says wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you so <laughs> uh, well Carson uh, one of the things I enjoy about this class and this Bible study is the fact that if you have a question or opinion, you can stop, ask questions, mm -hmm. focus on it, and then get a resolution. Or, yeah. To me, a lecture mm -hmm. is not a Bible study, it's a lecture. Yeah. Uh, that, and re the reason I say that is I feel like with the group, with, with the Bible study that we have, if we have a question, just like this conversation started off, mm -hmm. that's the way you learn, is yeah. discuss. Yeah. Yeah. But mm -hmm. when you are listening to a lecture, mm -hmm. you don't holler, whoa, time out, what about this? Yeah. And yeah. you feel like you're in the minority and you don't want to interrupt, so mm -hmm. it's going through the motions without getting any gain from it. Yeah. And somewhere, you know, a mistake was made way back whenever, when everything became so formalized mm -hmm. that, you know, when you're listening to lesson, sermon, whatever, you can't say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Explain explain what you just said. Because I'm not seeing that. Or I, I don't get that. Explain, where do you, you know, where do you get that? And whoever's speaking should be able to stop and explain it. Or, well, let's look back over here. Here's some supporting scriptures that give reason for why we, why we believe that. But a lot uh, of them can't explain it if you stop them, and that's why no, that's right. they don't even yeah. give you that opportunity because yeah. they can't explain it in the first place. Which kind of comes back to one reason why you don't hear facts pointed out in churches a lot of times about where our customs came from. You know, how do we tell these these pagan components that are, are have crept in and are part of our whole, you know, cultural, religious outlook uh, is because a lot of those, you know, a lot of preachers, teachers don't take the time to learn anything about it themselves. They don't get the facts. And, you know, I guess maybe they don't ever ask questions. Uh, maybe they never wondered why it's that way. And some people are just not that way. It's not their learning style. But, you know... Probably in any body of Christ setting, church setting, there should be some people in there that do have that kind of inquisitive mind that have found out those things. And, you know, that's when they need to be able to exercise their spiritual gifts and give those answers and, and so forth. So, but anyway, a lot of them, you know, don't talk about it because they don't know. They either don't think it's important or whatever. You know, then you get into that uh, kind of an attitude that, well, None of that stuff's important. We don't need to know any of that. All we need to know is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and that's all we need to know. We're going to heaven when we die. So do we just muddle along through life and you know, uh, remain in the congregation of ignorant brethren all of our life and never, never uh, effective in taking active part in God's plan and purpose? You know? Uh, and and, and it, things are offensive to God, too, that we do. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Is offensive to him and what we're doing properly. 
Exactly. If, if is we're, no I mean, this is offensive if we were seen sitting in a bar somewhere and drinking everything and stuff yeah. God's eyes. You know, not yeah, to so. To love the brethren, but it is to God. Uh, you know, our, now that we're going through these kind of fundamental steps in talking about our, our sonship and the plan and purpose that God has for us. <clears throat> to grow and mature so that we're you mean to turn the fans over? Yeah, I don't know. Turn them on. Uh, but where we're 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 growing to labor with our Heavenly Father as mature sons and daughters, okay. Those kind of things well here's one of the things we have to do, and this is kind of a uh, practical uh, you know, something to do, an exercise along within that education is okay. We need to examine and see what things could be in our lives that could be stumbling blocks to that. Because these like pagan stuff, you know, since God is not imputing our sins to us, He's not going to, you know, rain thunderbolts on us if we go to the grandkids' Easter egg hunt. But still at the same time, there are things that are going to effectively stop us from progressing to where God wants us to be. And listen, as we learn these things, I mean, just the, just the stuff that we've learned about our identity in Christ, the, you know, the differences in God's plan and purpose for Israel, His plan and purpose for us, what's coming in the future, rightly dividing the word, uh, the uh, cycles of judgment and, and these things that we're studying, the more of this that we understand, the more responsibility we have to, you know, the, the old days of that mentality of we're supposed to just, once we get saved and we just go to church every Sunday and Wednesday or whenever and, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you just go and you sit there and listen to the preacher and you sing the songs and put your money in the plate and then go home. And that equates Christianity. Well, that's okay for children who never come to understand it. But for those that are coming into understanding, and I'm not saying that you can't still do those things, but there are going to come times when you're going to have to do something. You know, either have to say something about the things that you see are not right, or, you know, you're, you're going to have to, or you'll be compelled to uh, try to, I don't know, make corrections, initiate change, uh, help people understand, you know, more than where they are to, Kind of uh, come up in their understanding. That's what I think this morning. To me, that's what the morning night class is. Mm -hmm. Is because I think the church is good. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, overall, you know, in the deal, it's good. I like the church and everything. It's got the kids come into it and everything mm -hmm. like that. But like you're talking about, most people, they, you know, are just going and sitting and getting mm -hmm. a sermon and they're not really well, doing anything, you know, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, but I think. It, Classes like this here, not probably just this class, there's other classes all around the world, you know. Mm -hmm. But you learn and then try to incorporate that back somehow into the church yeah. through steady prayer with God and His guidance, yeah. the Holy Spirit's guidance, and to bring it into the church to try to change some of those things, you know, yeah. without the whole, you know, guillotine deal and everything. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so, yeah. you, know, uh, you just go in there and try to say, hey, you know, it's this way. You know what happens, you know. Yeah. 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 Who do you but, think you are? You know, exactly. But, you know, I mean, I agree. I think there's, there's things in the church that need to be changed. And mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of people who love Jesus, you know, and everything that would really want to change and do what's right. Yeah. But it's just getting the training and getting the yeah. emotion going. Well, the problem is most churches treat the congregation like sheep. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They steer them the way they want them to go. Mm -hmm. I was told, I've been told this a lot of times, but I was told this recently about, you know, about uh, 
uh, I can't do, you can't think more or less or do or act with until your pastor gets the word from God. No. And I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, I want my pastor to be involved in prayer and I want him to get the word from God and everything. But I don't have to wait on nobody to, to, to get up, you know, to yeah. receive something from God. You know, yeah. that, that that like that's what this, what this that is, is for. That you know? like a cult. Yeah, yeah, that's, cult. yeah, that's one of those cult I'm, characteristics I'm we looked at. Many times, I've had that argument a lot. I'm like, no, 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 yeah. no. I don't follow. Yeah, I agree. You know, I go to church and I'm supposed to get that message on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. get the word and all that. I believe in all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But my follow, I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's what I follow. Yeah. I'm not supposed to follow you right. or, or anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to follow what Christ says. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing about you. You're always look it up. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that's one thing I, I love about the classes because mm -hmm. right or wrong or however you want to look at it, it gives you into the Bible and gets yeah. you looking at it and yeah. saying, well, yeah. okay, is he right? Is this right? Yeah. What's going on? Here? Because the thing is, if we're not digging into the Word, we're not going to be corrected. Not then, correct, you're not going to you know, grow. We're not going to grow. you're not going to have the power to fight. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Isn't it Pastors or the preacher's job to every Sunday or Wednesday give you a sermon, give you a sermon, educate you a little bit. What bring, you bring a message. Yeah, bring yeah. a message. And then you take that and go tell others about it. From what I've seen here and there, everybody sits there like stuck on a log. Yeah. I'm like, you're being educated. Go do something with it. You're being well, a lot of times, go tell somebody they want. when you got a room full of saved people, that all they're getting is you need to be saved. It's like somebody needs to say, hey, we're all saved already, okay? Is, is there nothing past that? Well, yes, there is. And this is one of the things that has graded on me for decades. Is that it's like, you know, once you're saved, then that's just it. You know, and I'm looking in the morning, I'm saying, no, wait a minute, that's not all there is. There, there, there's some... You know, it, or or it's like you're saved, and then in, instead of having the Old Testament uh, rules and laws, because they'll all tell you, oh, we're not in the law. But then they just take this new set of New Testament laws and give you those. You're supposed to do this, this, and this. And if you're not doing this, this, and this, you better check in. Ignoring what like Paul that. told us, that we're no longer under tools and governors. But we are led of the Spirit who instructs us in His Word to know God's will. And we operate in the body of Christ as a, as a family unit, you know, uh, like a household, more or less. Not as, a, not as a cult, not as a corporation. And we've let this kind of cultish thing come in where we've got this leader up at the top, or we've got this hierarchy up at the top of staff and, you know, all these, you know, up here, and all the rest of you are down here, and you're all stupid. And if I don't tell you what God has to say, then you're not going to know because you're all too stupid. You know, if I don't know it, surely you're not going to know it either. So that's kind of the attitude we have. It's, you know, pretty pervasive, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> it is. It's a lazy religion. Now, I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of preachers that are just flat lazy. Because they want to get up there. It, it's easy. Anybody, anybody can do it. You can go anywhere in the Bible and you can pick out a verse or two and you, you can make a salvation message out of it. And they uh, justify that by saying, well, there's nothing more important than people coming to Christ and being saved. Which is true. There, there's nothing more important than that. It's the most important thing, but it's not the only important thing, you know. You so you have these people trained, like you talked That's about, right. To go out and get more people, and not right, not seeing that that God's plan and purpose is designed to function in a certain way, so that He, in order to to do the work that He wants done in the world, uh, when those people come in to Christ. They start to learn, they become educated, they grow to the point where they understand what the Father's thinking, they understand what His uh, goals are, and they join Him in that work using the specific gifts and skills that he's, He has equipped them with. According to 
you know, their personality type and, and all those other factors uh, that come together there to uh, make them effective in what they do. And then they join with other members who are also growing to maturity, laboring, laboring with the Father, and the Father's work gets done. So, that, you know, one group here, they're learning the Word, they're growing, people are growing within that group, and then they become educated, and they go back to where they live, and they do the same thing. And that group grows, and they educate members within there. They go to where they live, like or, and like just like Paul did, you know. So that's really the way it's supposed to work. But we messed up somewhere way back there and let the corporate institutional structure creep in. And so that's the way it's been ever since. The, that's my opinion. You know, you the know, visible the church. You talk about the great missions go out into the world and mm -hmm. you spread the word. Well, mm -hmm. what do we do? Stay in Blue Road. Wait for them to come to us. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can't do that. That's not the great yeah. mission. Well, and you know, I'm guilty of that. My own. I can't blame anybody for that myself. Yeah. That's my personal deal right there. Is you know, I fall into the trap, and I don't go out, and I don't do. You know, that's something that I'm working on changing in my life, and being trying to get equipped. Because that's always one thing I've always been yeah. worried about. Yeah, is going out and telling somebody the wrong thing. Yeah, or something, and then there you are. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I've got to worry. I've, I've read the Bible before in my life. You know, I've read it two or three times. I've studied it. I've been to seminar different things, something mm -hmm. like that. But I have not got as much out of it as I have in the last couple of years. Yeah. Because I've really got to where I you know, really dove into it and really start yeah. to get a question or something on my mind. I really get into it, mm -hmm. or I start thinking about telling somebody else, and I'm like, Yeah, okay, well, I won't be held accountable. I need to tell these people. Mm -hmm. I want to know what I'm telling. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's yeah. When you begin to to gain those keys of understanding. <laughs> and you, you know, put them in there, and it's like it, you know, something you've read a hundred times and just leaps off the page. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it makes it, you know, the way God set it up, it works, and it will work. This, the things we're talking about are, you know, our our sonship growth, it class. will work. Mike brought that up in our Sunday school yeah. class. It picked up the same thing. So, you know, we have to learn. You know, we're yeah. you know, we're not supposed to be out there, you know, with the babies and everything and stuff that come into church to get. Mm -hmm. Saved and you know, and start mm -hmm. beginning and everything. Mm -hmm. So, our Sunday school plans, you know, and stuff is to learn mm -hmm. to mature, yeah, to where we can, you mm -hmm. know, reach these people and everything. Yeah. You know. And the down in that is true, but when if that's not done in the correct way, then the proper growth doesn't happen. It's like a kid will grow. If all you feed them is Snicker bars and popcorn, right. but their growth won't be proper. And if you never, if you don't teach them anything, you know, then they they will grow, but their growth won't be proper. Like a, a kid that's not, you know, cared for or things like that. I mean, they will physically grow, but uh, but it won't be correct. They they won't become what they should have been. You know, so so the, the thing is that our biblical understanding needs to be within the right framework. Uh, and it, we need to understand, and this is another thing that has bugged me for many years about how things are done in the church, is that the, the teaching is not in a progressive manner as it should be. It's just grab something from here, grab something from down there, grab something from over here, and grab something from down here. And it's just this hodgepodge of, I don't know, topical stuff, and it's not bad. But it's not going anywhere. And that's the thing. But you know about the Great Commission. Remember what our commission is. Our commission is in 2 Corinthians 5.19. I mean uh, 18. Well, let me back up to verse 17. Where he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, 
not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So see, this is our commission. The Great Commission was for the Apostles. And it couldn't even be completed or fulfilled until the kingdom came in. So we, we've got this whole, you know, erroneous misunderstanding even about the Great Commission. And what have we done? We've taken the Great Commission, which wasn't even to us, and it, 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 even for them, unless the kingdom came in, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been fulfilled. And we've taken that and we've taken that and used it as a you know, a scourging whip to drive them, drive Christians along in to get out there and go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and baptize, blah, 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 blah. Instead of understanding, wait a minute, for us, specifically us who were Gentiles, who were God's enemies. Remember from, uh, if you remember from our uh, study in our identity in Christ, that under our condemnation, we were God's enemies. Not just, we weren't just lost sheep out there, you know, had lost our way. We weren't just, you know, bad or we were just sinners. No, no, no. We were enemies to God, actively involved in Satan's policy to thwart every one of God's plans and usurp his possession and His heavenly throne. We were actively involved in that through these deceptive counterfeits that we've been talking tonight. These things we, all this paganism that has crept into the church, that is deliberately part of Satan's plan and his policy of evil to, you know, to thwart God's plan and to thwart the, 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 the power that God incorporated into His church. But, because God set it up this way, it won't work like it should work unless we understand these things and how it's supposed to be done. Unfortunately, and you know, none of us have ever been exposed to that. The only thing we've got is that we've all been shown the, the counterfeit. Mm -hmm. And this shows you how really cunning and smart really Satan is that he didn't take the saving gospel out of it. You know, he... Because here's the thing. Satan knew that he could not prevent people from getting saved. Because the gospel of Christ is infallible. I mean, anybody that picked up a Bible and, you know, read 1 Corinthians 15, you know, 1 through about 3, 4, or 5 there, where Paul's talking about the gospel, or any number of places through there, you can find the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, how he died for our sins, he was buried and he rose again, and if we you know, place our faith in him, uh, we're saved. We can have our sins forgiven and so forth. Satan knew that he, he could not really, he, he couldn't do away with it. It's too powerful. It's too, really, it's too simple. So, what he knew he must do, though, is short circuit what would happen after people got saved. So if somebody got saved, that's fine, lost that, doesn't want anybody to wind up in hell. There's more going on. There's more to the plan and purpose uh, than just that. And uh, God is demonstrating His power and His wisdom through us, through us fallible, growing, often childish members of the body of Christ who are still stuck in these sinful physical bodies, uh, he, he's demonstrating His power and wisdom through that to those principalities and powers that are against Him and have been against Him all the way from the beginning, who rebelled against Him. And when it comes down to the end of time, and as that brother thinks in Philippians Chapter 2, I think it is, where it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Uh, that's going to be Satan and all of the principalities and powers as well. All those angelic beings that rebelled with Satan and turned against God, joined Satan in his plan to usurp God's throne and his possession. 
And here's the thing. It's not going to just be that those principalities and powers are all forced to kneel before Jesus and they're going to be forced to confess that He is the Lord. When it comes down to it, God is going to demonstrate and prove, really, literally, in a court of law, God's own court, He is going to show that He is absolutely just and justified in all that He's done. And those, all those principalities and powers, they're going to admit, and they'll have to admit because it will be true, uh, that God is just and right in all of His judgments and in what He did, and that nobody, nobody except for God is qualified to be recognized as the Lord God Most High. And God is using us now as part of that plan. And uh, the, the more we know and the more we're educated in, uh, and godliness is the foundation learning to think like God thinks, learning to live God's way, and learning to labor with our Father. And those things, he, he uses us in those things in His overall plan and purpose to, uh, to accomplish that. Let's see if... Yeah. Uh, since we're kind of on that subject, let's jump to this slide and then we can continue the discussion. I thought of this. I knew I had this on here. So, uh, let's talk. this kind of sums up the reasons why God gives us salvation to begin with. This is what faith accomplishes. And this is one of those things that needs to be established in our minds. And number one, God is not as interested in our outward physical circumstances as He is in the condition of our inner man. Not that God's not concerned with our you know, physical life, our physical condition, our health, and, and, and all those kind of things. Yes, he's concerned, but he's much more concerned about the condition of our inner man. And here's one of the things that, as we continue through Romans and as we look at Paul's other writings, one of the things we're going to notice that's really not there is that in the things Paul talks about that we have as blessings from God as members of the body of Christ, none of those are physical blessings. Remember Israel, remember back in Leviticus 26, we're reading about the cycles of judgment, how God said, if you listen to my voice and keep my commandments, you'll have rain when you need it, your crops will grow, and you know uh, your fruit trees will be fruitful, all of your cattle and sheep and everything will be fruitful, you'll never go hungry, I'll protect you from your enemies, you'll have everything you need, and I will provide everything for you. You will have these physical blessings if you... Listen to my voice and obey my word. There's, there's nothing remotely like that in any of Paul's instructions to us. Our promises of blessing are spiritual things that we're strengthened in our inner man. That we have, uh, as Paul prayed, may we be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, those kind of things. So our, our blessings are spiritual blessings. You know, as far as like physical stuff, Paul gave instructions to us. He said, work with your hands <laughs> that you might, you know, have provide for yourself and have to give to those that are in need and those kind of things. He said, to, you know, to the, I think in the Thessalonians, uh, you know, the verse, we all know this one, if any man won't work, neither should he eat. So, <laughs> you know, Paul advocated Take care of your business. You know, work your farm. Uh, do your trade. And do the best you can at it. But, you know, while you're doing that, you know, uh, you're serving Christ in that. So, anyway, I just wanted to make that point. That God is not as interested in our outward physical circumstances as He is in the condition of our inner man. And really, this should, this should be a major factor in affecting our outlook 
and really our prayers too. Because, you know, I don't mean to just, you know, beat up the church. And I used to be just as bad. A lot of times we get kind of lazy in prayer too. You know, and, and I, you listen to our prayers. They're like, you know, pray for Granny. She stumped her toe. And, you know, pray for Grandpa. He, you know, sprained his wrist chopping firewood or something like that. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for people that, you know, are going through these things. But if... If that's all that our kind of our prayer life, prayer attitude consists of, there's something missing there because God's priority is what happens in our inner man, not just our outer man. Because through really our physical suffering, God is accomplishing some things even through that. And we're going to look at those when we get over in Romans chapter 8. Also, uh, well, because our outward physical body is only temporary, no matter what. These bodies are going in the grave, one way or another, unless we're alive when, you know, the Lord returns. If we, you know, as I believe, if we make it through the tribulation, we're here when He returns. Uh, and we receive glorified bodies. Uh, but unless that happens, <clears throat> I don't care what we do, eventually, you know, we're going to die. And that's just that's just the way it is. So, it's, it's more important of what happens in our inner man because listen, here's the great thing. The condition of our inner man, we don't lose that. And we were going to lose it, we're going to lose our body. You know, the strength that we had years ago, we're losing that. <laughs> you know, losing a little more of it every day as time goes by. But when we're strengthened, when we grow, we learn and we're, we become uh, more conformed to the image of Christ in our inner man, we will never lose that. We will take that with us into eternity. The Bible understanding that we have, we're going to take that with us into eternity. Now, kind of one of those common misconceptions that a lot of you know, Christians have is we think, well, it doesn't really matter whether I study the Bible or not because when I get to heaven, I'll just know everything. Got news for you, that's not really true. You know, don't find that in here anywhere. Uh, I think... You know, the understanding we have there is going to depend in large part on the understanding that we have here. So, also, God is working by His Word through His Spirit in our inner man to conform us to the image of Christ, to bring us to a perfect man, a mature. You know, remember, the definition of perfect there is not like, you know, flawless diamond type perfection, but it means mature. Uh, grown up with understanding and so forth, able to properly function as designed. That's kind of a good definition of perfect there. So these are, these are things that uh, we want to keep in mind. And this kind of gives us, in a, in a nutshell, two points, main points, that God wants to accomplish in us. Uh, as Christians. It's where he, what He wants us to bring us to. Now, out of this, do we see anything in here working by His Spirit in our inner man through His Word? So, uh, it's not, you know, magic. It's not focus, focus. God's not going to just wave His hand over us and, you know, zap us with spiritual power or anything like that. What, what He accomplishes is mainly going to come through His Word. So, uh, the inner man, just as the outward physical body is only temporary, the inner man is eternal, and it's conformed to the image of Christ. So, two good things we need to keep in mind. But anyway, I didn't mean to go into a whole long lecture. We were having a good discussion, so sorry about that. <laughs> well, I think it's great that Jamie asked the question to begin with, you know, that she felt comfortable yeah, yeah, asked yeah, the yeah. question that provokes yeah. thought, and yeah. it's opened up this discussion. Yeah. I think it's been good. I tell you what, I, I always enjoy those good, spontaneous discussion times like that. I mean, I get way more out of it than standing up here listening to myself lecture. So, that's good. Uh, yeah, that's that's good. We'll just uh, go into this next week. Because actually, to tell you the truth, when I was, uh, I was sitting there before we came tonight, I was looking back over the scriptures. And I saw, you know, several things that I, I needed to kind of add into the notes. So that's good to give me an opportunity to do that. So, good. Anybody got any other anything else before we go? 
All right. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we do thank you.